Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Fagan Maradian here at the 2019 Association of the United States Army's General Meeting in Washington, D.C., number one gathering of U.S. Army leaders from around the world. Our coverage here is sponsored by General Motors Defense, Bell, L3 Harris, Leonardo DRS, and it's our honor to be talking to the 40th Chief of Staff of the United States Army General, Jim McConville. Sir, thanks so much for the time, especially on this first day of this great AUSA. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, and uh, uniform, sir, looks uh, absolutely uh, awesome. Um, Number one question, we're in a time of fleeting uh, advantage at a time when technological leveling has given great powers uh, the same kind of capabilities as we do. Everybody is talking about the importance of uh, talent to quickly identify strategic trends, threats, uh, and uh, opportunities. How are you designing, mapping, and the talent management system and growth system you want to equip the force, the intellectually, for those kind of multi-domain operations we're going to face in the future? Well, well first of all, the, the Army is people. It's our most important asset. It's our most important weapon system. So for me, people is my number one priority. And so what we're doing is we're moving from an industrial age personnel management system to a 21st century talent management system where we will recognize the individual talents, the knowledge, skills, behavior, and even the preferences of, of our soldiers, non-commissioned officers, and officers, we can get the right person, the right job at the right time. So talk to us about specifically what you want to do, because you've got basically a million people in uniform. What, give, give us some specific examples about how you want to harness capability quickly to deliver yeah. uh, answers. Well, the, f the first thing is, well, right now in the Army, we have three different personnel systems. So we have one for the regular Army, one for the National Guard, and one for the Reserve. So we cannot see all the talent throughout the Army. So what we're doing right now is we're, we're bringing a new system in, the integrated personnel and pay system, that will have all three components on one, on one system. Now what that's gonna allow us to do, and I, and I saw this, I was a one star in Afghanistan, we're getting ready to do the surge uh, in Afghanistan, and I had all these great guard and reserve units all working together. And so I asked them to tell me what their talents were besides their, their basically branch and grade. And they filled this out on an Excel spreadsheet. And what I found out that I had a sergeant that either owned or worked an engineering design firm, and that sergeant is the one that designed all the Ford operating bases and air bases that we used um, as we went forward. I found I had a major that worked for the, the Texas Highway Department, and we were building roads, so what better person to do that than, you know, than him? And then, you know, if you notice, I'm from Boston. You know, uh, we don't have a whole lot of farms in Boston. We have pictures of farms, but we don't have a whole lot of farms. So I had some great guardsmen who were from Nebraska and Iowa that really knew how to do agriculture. So they became our agribusiness development experts and helped us grow. So this is the type of talent that we're trying to tap across the force. And that's what's going to be the difference. When we have this talent management uh, system in place, we'll be able to see that. I'm, I'm from uh, New York City, so the first time I saw a cow uh, was in the Central Park uh, Zoo, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Talk to us about um, an example, uh, the Liberian example, yeah. uh, that I think is a really, really powerful thing because the Army just looks at basically two metrics uh, as a general rule instead of more. That's right. I, I had just left uh, command the 101st Airborne Division, and shortly after the 101st was alerted to go to Liberia and did a wonderful job of getting after uh, the Ebola virus that was going on. So I just happened to be in Korea visiting, and I was talking to an officer, and I asked him, you know, where he's from, and he told me he's from Liberia. So here we have an officer who's a wonderful officer in Liberia because we manage him by two variables. When I probably had, you know, officers that weren't that skilled working in Liberia. So, so that's what we want to be able to do to take that officer, know more about him, and he would have loved to gone to Liberia with the language skills, with the cultural skills to be able to do that mission. Um, you're also looking at direct accessions, the likes of which the Army probably hasn't done since World War II, to fill select skill sets. Uh, you also want to change how long people people can pass on promotion, something that's an unprecedented uh, concept. Um, for the direct accessions, both an officer and NCO, you want talent sets to come in to help the active duty force, but there are folks who may be a little bit butthurt about that. How do you, you know, who went through a conventional pr uh, promotion process. What's the right way you're going to do this to make sure that the folks who you want to benefit from it actually benefit from it? Well, there's a, there's a sweet spot there. And what we, what we have found with the young men and women we're competing for, they do not want to be interchangeable parts in an industrial age process. So if you have a specific talent in areas like cyber, space, uh, artificial intelligence, some of those skill sets that, that we need, and we can quantify that skill set, we may bring you in as a captain or a major because we absolutely need that skill set to win in the battlefield. Um, what, how big do you think this direct accessions program will be? Because, you know, y you can look at 
so many instances where the Army can use it. You can even means test this, so if somebody doesn't really require pay or TRICARE or other benefits, you don't necessarily have to give it to them. What, how broadly can the Army use this? Because this could become a really, really big and important program at a time when the number of people in uniform is shrinking relative to the population to then act as ambassadors for the force nationwide. Well, I, th I, think, I think what we could see uh, in, in the future is that, you know, the numbers, you know, we're not going to bring someone in from IBM to command the 101st Airborne Division. Probably not going to happen. But what I can see is someone coming in that, that's working at a major tech firm, coming in for a couple of years and working to help us do data management or data analysis or one of these, or artificial intelligence or any of those technical type skills. And they could come in for a couple of years and they could go out for a couple of years. We're starting to see even professionals who've changed the rules where you can come in as an older person. Now there's people out there that have done extremely well in the, in the, in the tech industry. And all of a sudden they're at that part of the life, they don't need to make any more money, and they want to come in, they want to serve their country, they want to give something back. They could come on in a couple, couple of years, they might want to be a lieutenant colonel, and just transform the programs that we have in place. I, I see that as the future. And so I see the ability to move back and forth between the reserves, I see the ability to come on active duty, but it, what's going to be driven is the skill set. Not everyone's going to be able to do this, but if you have a specific skill set at a certain level that we can use, I can see this happening. Um, let me ask you, uh, about building up those skill sets. Very senior leaders, uh, even at the four-star uh, rank across the services, have said, look, we understand pr our principal warfare specialty, we understand air, land, sea, space uh, to a lesser degree, but fundamentally we're not as comfortable in the cyber, AI, electromagnetic spectrum, 5G. How are you going to do this so that those senior officers who are making the decisions are as comfortable in these spaces as they need to be given how fast future war is going to move? Well, first of all, we're doing a lot of training to, to get them more comfortable, but it's also bringing the expertise in. And, you know, we're taking a look at some of our commands, and at every level we're going to have multi-domain operations capability, which means that not only can our units operate on the land, sea, and air, but they also can operate in space, and, and cyber, and that is very, very important. I think our senior leaders understand that. And we're also seeing that below the level of armed conflict where that is especially important. Do you, um, you know, you mentioned uh, below the level of armed conflict, perhaps one of the most strategic weapons uh, the United States and its allies face is disinformation uh, in a targeted fashion. Social media is something where from the senior most to the most junior ranks are very comfortable, very open oftentimes. And to cyber experts, that gives topographic targeting maps to our adversaries. What's the way the Army is going to try to fight disinformation in its ranks, considering that we are already in contact. You know, one of your co uh, former colleagues, uh, General Neller, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, used to say, we're at full up war in cyberspace and in the disinformation space. How are you going to do that within the ranks of the Army? Well, we, we have uh, a, a very robust cyber capability, but we are also recognize that we do need to uh, be in the information operations space. We need to be in the electronic warfare space. We need to be in the space space, so to speak. And so we're starting to develop those type units. We're standing up uh, multi-domain task forces that are going to have an intelligence, information, uh, cyber, electronic warfare, and space capability. And also, as we look at our Army Cyber Command, we are reorganizing that to address those issues. Um, when it comes to uh, the threat, a very good uh, strategist friend of mine uh, mentioned that, you know, we are, uh, the United States uh, military in general is very fond about the way, about talking about the way it would like to fight adversaries, as opposed to actually talking a lot about how the adversary is going to likely fight us in very novel and innovative ways. What are some of the things the Army is doing to make sure that at every level, everybody understands how adaptable, highly capable, longer sticked adversaries may fight them as opposed to going in there with the idea of how it is we're going to fight them. No, we have to fight fight the uh, the adversary that we're going to fight and so as, as we develop our, our training programs, uh, our combat training centers right now bring in electronic warfare, they bring in the cyber, but we're also developing cyber rangers and the capability to to train in these domains uh, that we haven't in the past and uh, that, that's, that's happening right as we speak. Um, your uh, predecessor and the preceding uh, secretary uh, are now the Secretary of Defense and uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of, of Staff. They talked a lot about urban warfare, but we're hearing a little bit less about the importance of urban warfare now. Talk to us about that transition and how you're integrating that into your strategic vision in the well, future. We, I mean, as, as we take a look around the world and we see where the populations live, you know, we recognize the importance of urban warfare 
urban warfare. So we have not walked away that. We're continuing to develop systems as we put requirements in for our future systems, uh, whether it's the next generation combat vehicle, it's a future vertical lift. They are designed to operate in deep urban terrain and we're and, and that's going to give us those capabilities we need along with the, the doctrine and training that goes along with that. Um, talk to us about how you're working with your uh, counterparts. Each one of you uh, was selected for their uh, sense of innovation, their sense of the urgency of the threat, and how to take care of some of those structural challenges, not just on the acquisition part, but on the human talent management part. How are you working with Dave Goldfein, uh, General Berger, uh, as well as Admiral Gilday to have this integrated whole as you guys look at this uh, battle space? Well, I think we're working very, very closely. Uh, each of the services has strengths. Each of the services have thought through what they think the, the future fight is going to be. But we're working very closely to make sure that we have a, a, a concept for joint operations. And that's where uh, I think we're going to get the greatest gains. And also, we're sharing technology. There's, there's programs that we're working on that uh, some of the other services have the lead, and we're falling in behind them. There's other programs that we actually have the lead, and they're falling in us. So it's the collaboration and the sharing to make sure that we have the best military in the world. Um, do you, um, what, as you talk to audiences and you work with your senior staff, um, what is the vision of future? conflict because there is a lot of debate and discussion about what that potentially looks like what parts of those are kinetic uh, there's a lot of discussion that I've talked to uh, with very senior uh, army leaders about how um, b bloody and casualty heavy that that future might be what's your assessment on what that future operational environment is going to look like so that folks most appropriately wrap their heads around it well I, I, I think you know, many of us have talked about great power competition and I, I don't think we ever want to get to great power conflict because of the lethality of the uh, the near peer competitors but what, what I think we're going to see is is people going to operate as close to or below the level of armed conflict we're seeing seeing that happen already whether it's you know it could be cyber it could be space we certainly have to be ready uh, for a great power conflict and that's part of the mili military's job but we want to make sure that never happens because it would be very devastating to all of our populations and all of our people, and, and that's something we want to avoid. And we think we avoid that by having a very strong military that can deter that type of action. Um, do you think that there needs to be maybe a little bit more candid discussion with the American people about the risks and the challenges, everything from cyber operations to what the realities of conflict would be? I remember at the worst parts of the Iraq War, you know, people were very, very moved at the sacrifice that soldiers uh, and, say, and uh, Marines were, were making uh, in, in the theater. I know that you led forces uh, as well. Does there need to be somewhat more of a candid and broader conversation with the American people about what the stakes and the risks might be in a future conflict? Well, I think, I think the American people need to understand uh, that we need a very, very strong military. And we also need their support. And um, we need their sons and daughters to, to join and, 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 and help us preserve this great country of ours. Um, do you think that you get over that L-shaped uh, recruiting curve uh, that General Milley used to talk about in terms of getting that broader diversity uh, into the force? Well, we, we're, we're trying to. Uh, we've been, um, again, we're trying to move from an industrial age recruiting force to an information age uh, recruiting force, and we're doing things like eSports. We've got a CrossFit team out there. I think the thing we need to do uh, as the Army is get out and see the people more. Once they see our soldiers and they see these great young men and women that, that, that actually serve in the military and they get an idea of what the military is all about and the fact that the Army offers so many opportunities, I think more young men and women are going to serve. I have three kids serving. And many of the senior officers uh, have their, uh, their children serving. And you know, if we didn't believe in it, I don't think they would be serving. And, and that direct uh, accessions model allows you to touch many, many more people, doesn't it, across society at a time when the percentage of those serving in uniform is shrinking? Yeah, I think so. And, and when, when I look at, you know, someone asked me, why, why would you want to join the Army? Here's what I would tell them. First of all, you're going to have purpose. You're going to have purpose in life. You're going to belong. You're going to be part of the most respected uh, team, really, in the, in the country. And the third thing for parents is, it's a great pathway to success. I mean, there's so many opportunities to get education, uh, to get ahead in life, and so I think we just need to make sure people understand what it's all about. And there's so many options, you know, from infantry to cyber and everything in between to aviation, so I think it's a great opportunity for young men and women to consider. And uh, Army-Navy game, uh, I know that uh, you're going to be looking forward to another uh, great meeting. Yes. How do you think the game's going to go? Well, I think, I, think, I think it's pretty obvious I think Army's going to win. <laughs> Very good. Because here's the deal, because winning matters. <laughs> yeah. I, I think the Navy would look at it that way, too, but uh, you're going to give the edge to Army this year. Absolutely. No question about it. Winning does matter. <laughs>
fantastic. General Jim McConville, who hails from Quincy, Massachusetts, which I should say is another great Army Chief of Staff, Gordon Sullivan's hometown as well. That's right. It's a pleasure seeing you. A and the Chairman's, uh, General Dunford. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. I, I uh, forgot, didn't want to say I forgot General uh, Don't Dunford. Don't General Dunford. Uh, no. no, I won't. Uh, and as a, as a Yankee fan, I know the deepness of his passion for the Red Sox. That's right. We're all, we're all Red Sox fans, and you can be too, okay? <laughs> Thanks very much, yeah. sir. Thank you. Appreciate it.